Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here, the GMAT Official Guide 2021. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Today we'll solve some data sufficiency problems. Data sufficiency problems that you will find on page number 211. Turn to it. Make sure the book is in front of you. Turn to page 211. Very first one that you see there is number 339. If after having watched the video you decide that this was useful and that you would like to work with me, that you would like to hire me as your tutor to get you ready for the exam, you can reach me at kishwaniprep at icloud.com. Let's take a look at the very first one. It says 9 squares, 9 squares are to be filled, are to be filled with axes and zeros. Question simply is how many how many axes do we have? Let's see what they tell us. So here we are given here we are given a layout of nine squares right there. And question is how many of them have axes? It says more than half will have zeros. Well simply knowing that more than half are zeros it doesn't tell us anything. Maybe all of them are zeros or maybe eight of them are zeros only one x or maybe five of them are zeros and only four x. We can't really tell by, by simply knowing that more than half of them are zeros. The first statement by itself is not enough. A, D, B, C, E. Since the first statement, by, first statement by itself is not enough we know now the answer cannot be A or D. Let's look at second one. Second one tells us that uh, the four corners, four corners have axes. And what we're trying to figure out is how many axes there are. We know, second someone tells us that in four corners we have axes, but we cannot answer how many axes there are because we don't know how many more there are. Maybe they are all axes. Or maybe that's all there is. Maybe there are only four, maybe there are nine, maybe there are eight. We can't really tell. Answer cannot be B. But when we put the two statements together, when we put the two statements together, now we can answer the question, how many axes do we have? Well, we can very easily answer it because we know the corners have to take axes and we also know that more than half have to be zero. Since there are only nine of them, more than half makes it five. There you go. We satisfy both the conditions, more, more than half of them are zero and all the corners have axes. We can answer how many axes there are. There are only four axes. Number 340. Number 340. Some of them are some of them are quite straightforward. Don't think too much about it. Number 340. It says is the sum is the sum of two integers. We are told that we have two integers. Is their sum divisible by 10. Let's see what they tell us. We don't know what those two integers are and they are asking us if the sum is divisible. It says one of the integers, one of them, one of them is even. Well if one of them is even we can't really tell what the other one is and we can't really tell you the sum. We are looking for the sum of these two things. We know one of them is even so maybe one of one is 8 and one is 2 which is even and the other one is 8 in which case the sum is divisible by 10. Or maybe instead of 8, maybe it is 81, in which case the sum is not divisible by 10. We can't really answer. A, D, B, C, E. Answer cannot be A or D. Let's look at second one. It says, it says that uh, one of the integers, one of the integers is a multiple of 5. One of the integer is a multiple of 5. Again, simply knowing that one of the integers is multiple of 5, we cannot really tell if the sum is divisible by 5. It depends. Maybe, maybe one of them is 5 and the other one is 6. Or maybe one of them is 5 and the other one is 16, in which case they are divisible by 
And they are, but even then it's not divisible. But, uh, but you get the idea. You can't really tell. You can't really tell. One of them is the multiple of 5. This is the multiple of 5. And uh, uh, this, is, this is not a multiple of 5. Right now the sum is not divisible by right now the sum is not divisible by 10 or maybe one of them is 5 which is a multiple of 5 and the other one is 75 in which case the sum is divisible by 10 you get the idea it's not enough even when we put the two together even we put the two together simply knowing that one is a multiple of 5 and one is even one is even and one is multiple of 5 let's say maybe maybe one is 6 and the other one is uh, 10 you see one is even the other one is a multiple of 5 in this case, their sum is not is not divisible by it's not divisible by ten, or maybe uh, maybe uh, the first one is ten, the other one is ten also. So this one is even, and that one is a multiple of five. This is the first condition, second condition, and now it is now it is divisible by ten. You can't really tell. You can't really tell. There is not much there at all. The answer is E. Number three forty one. Number 341. It says, is x an integer? Well, the first statement tells us that x cubed is equal to 8. Well, if x cubed is equal to 8, that implies obviously that x is equal to 2. The answer is yes, it is an integer. We, we can answer the question by using the first statement alone, which means the answer cannot be b, c, or e. It would have to be either a or d. Second statement goes on to tell us that x is equal to square root of 4. Again, if x is equal to square root of 4, it is 2 obviously. It is an integer. The answer is D. That was a gift. That was a gift. That was too silly. That was just way too silly. But like I told, like I told you before, don't complain about the silly ones because those are gifts. If somebody wants to give you a gift, take it. It says the building has 6,000 square meter of area, floor space. The question is, how many, how many offices does it have? It's a commercial building, it's an office building, and we are told that the square footage of the floor is 6,000 6, square meter. The question is how many offices does it have? Let's see what we do. let's see what we are told. The first one tells us that one quarter of the space is not offices. If one quarter of that is not offices, one quarter of six thousand is fifteen hundred, which means now, which means we now we know now that 4,500 square, 4, square meter is used for offices. Of the of the 6,000 square meter, 25% is not used for offices. Of course, not all of this is going to be used for offices. You need you need uh, floor space for the corridor, for the hallways, for elevators, for bathrooms. All of those there take 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 up space. But three quarter of the space is used for offices. But simply knowing that three quarter of the space is used for offices does not enable us in any shape or form to be able to answer how many offices there are until we know something more about the offices themselves. The first statement by itself is not enough. A, A, D, B, C, E. Answer cannot be A or D. Let's look at what the second statement tells us. Second statement tells us that 20, 20 executive offices 20 executive offices there are 20 executive offices and each takes three times the floor space of ordinary office. Ordinary office space would be the office space for the regular worker and then apparently there are 20 executives in the building they each have their own office and the executive offices we are told take, take up three times the floor space of a regular office. Is there enough to figure out how many offices there are? Of course not. The answer is not B. Even we put them together even if we put, it, put them together, I was a bit hasty in that one. Even if we put them together, the answer is E. There is not enough information for us to figure out 
what how many offices there are and here's here's what we need to know obviously you already know it let me raise this so we have room here's what we need to know we know there are 20 executive offices and we know that each of them take up three times each of them takes up three times the space of an ordinary office let's call the area of the ordinary office uh, area of the ordinary office A area area of ordinary office area of the ordinary office is for the ordinary worker three times that there are 20 of them and each takes three times the area of the ordinary office so that's the square footage of the offices that are occupied by the executive then we have n number of ordinary offices each with the area a and that has to equal 4500 and what we're trying to figure out is the n if we figure out how many ordinary offices are there we can answer the question the question was how many offices are there in the building is n plus 20 n for the ordinary workers and 20 for the 20 executive we can figure out how many but we cannot answer this we cannot figure out this quantity n until we know the square footage until we know the square footage of the of an ordinary office and they don't tell us the answer is e i hope that in i hope that in a real exam you wouldn't have to do all this out you, sh you should be able to see right away when something is not there you should be able to see right away that it cannot be done they're asking too much information without giving you much at all how can you figure out how many offices there are by simply knowing that there are 20 executive offices and each one of them takes three times the area of the ordinary office and there's 1400 uh, 40, or rather 4500 square footage you, you can't but if you wanted to see the math that's the equation what number was that that was 342 let's look at 343 343 says the P, R and S are three consecutive integers in ascending order they are consecutive integers in ascending order that is that is they are increasing which means p is more than r and r is more than s and they are consecutive we know that we know that they're consecutive the question is this the question is what is their average what is their average that's the question let's see what they tell us let's see what they tell us it says that it says that statement one says twice their average twice their average equals equals their sum twice their average equals their sum oh and the question here is what is their average which they are calling x they're calling the average x are you, are you with me so far so here we go it says twice their average. Twice their average is going to be because they're calling average. They're calling average to be x. Twice their average is going to be two times x is equal to their sum, which is p plus r plus s. P plus r plus s. Now let's talk about what their average is going to actually look like. Let's do it on the top. What they're calling here x, the average. The average has to be p plus r plus s divided by three. Makes sense, doesn't it? That is their average, which is what they're calling x. Which means this equation implies that their sum must equal 3 times x. Obviously, 3 times x must be p plus r plus s. That's what we have right here, p plus r plus s, which we know is 3 times x because the, the sum has to be 3 times the average. Which means that 2 times x has to equal 3 times x. And the only way that is possible, the only way that will be possible that 2 times some quantity is equal to 3 times some quantity is when that quantity is 0, a big fat 0. So the question was, what is their average? Can we answer that question? The answer is yes, we can answer it. Their average is equal to 0. Their average is equal to 0. Which means AD, BCE. Which means that the first statement by itself was quite sufficient for, for us to be able to answer the question. Answer cannot be B, C, or E. It would have to be A or D. 
depending on what we get out of the second statement. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells, oh there you go, second statement is very straightforward. Second statement says that their sum is equal to zero. Well, if if their if their sum is equal to zero, that implies that their their average must also be zero. Because the uh, average is simply sum divided by 3. If the sum is 0, average must be 0. There you go. And the average is x. x is equal to 0, which is exactly, which is exactly what, we, what we found in the first statement. As I always remind you, they never contradict each other. If the first statement tells you that the x is, x is 0, and after you finish the work on the second statement, and it tells you that x is not 0, x, x is something else, then something has gone wrong. x is equal to 0. Which means that even by using the second statement all by itself, we are still able to answer the question, what's the average of these three integers, these three consecutive inches? The answer is, their average is zero. Therefore, this answer to this question is D. Each statement by itself is quite sufficient for us to be able to figure out what is going on. That was number 343, the very last one on the page, 344. Three hundred and forty-four. Let's see what it says. Three hundred and forty-four says m and n. We are told are integers. We are told that they are whole numbers. The question is, how much is how much is m plus n? That's the question. We want to find out. We want to find out their sum. We want to know what is their sum. Let's see what they tell us. Let's see what they tell us. The statement 1 tells us that x plus m times x plus n equals x squared plus 5x plus m times n. That's it. Let's see what we can do. Let's open this parenthesis and see what we get. Let's open the parenthesis. x times x is going to give us x squared x times n is going to give us nx, x times m is going to give us mx, and then finally we have mn, and that has to equal x squared plus 5x plus mn. I don't like it. It should have lined up properly, but it doesn't. It's all right. Let's, let's cross out whatever we find, whatever we find the same on both sides. So if you subtract x squared from both sides, this is going to drop out, and here's mn, here's mn, they're going to drop out. Which means, there you go, we are done. Which means, huh. which means what we are left with here is did I make a mistake? n times x, m times x, mn. Oh, this is mn and this is not mn. That's where I made a mistake. I knew I made a mistake somewhere else. We, subtract, we are subtracting m times n from here. We must subtract this quantity, not that quantity, not this term, not the third term, but the fourth term. I made a mistake. So I knew something had gone bizarre. So we have nx and here we have mx. And this should have been cancelled out with that one. This and that. There we go. That must. That is much better. I knew things were not working out. Let's, let's finish it up. So here we have nx. There we go. Now we are done. nx and mx. Let's take out x common. And we are left with m plus n, which we are told equals 5x. Because that's the only thing that is left here. There we go. Therefore, their sum must equal 5. The question was, what is their sum? Can we answer that, qu can we answer that question based on what is given to us in the first statement? The answer is yes. A, D, B, C, E. Answer cannot be B, C, or E. It will have to be either A or D. Let's see what the second statement tells us. Second statement proudly tells us, second statement proudly tells us that their product is 4. Their product is 4. Can we answer what is their sum? The answer is no. We cannot tell what their sum is just because their product is 4. Just because their product is 4. 
or is there some maybe it is uh, 2 and 2 maybe it is 2 and 2 in which case the sum is going to be 4 maybe it is 1 and 4 in which case the sum is 5 maybe it is uh, uh, they have to be integers well 0 is an integer but then that's one, that one equal 4 um, what else can it be it has to be 4 uh, 1 4 that's about it if it's 2 and 2 the sum is 4 if it's 1 and 4 the sum is 5 we cannot really answer what the sum is Obviously, we cannot answer what the sum of the two integers is just because we know their product. That's not going to work. The answer is A. Only the first statement by itself does the job. That was the end of that page. We're going to stop right here because that's the end of the page. We'll meet again tomorrow, as always, and we'll do some multiple choice problems tomorrow. And then day after tomorrow, we'll pick up, pick up the data sufficiency problem where we left off. If you'd like to get hold of me, as I said in the beginning of the video, if you'd like to work with me, you can send me an email at kishwaniprep.com or rather kishwaniprep at icloud.com kishwaniprep at icloud.com kishwaniprep.com is also another way you can get hold of me. That's my website and on that you will find a link for our other email address which, which works just as fine. Do you understand? Bye now.